Bismillahirrahmanirrahim We begin with Allah's blessed name We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers And in particular on the last of them all The blessed Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam As we greet you with Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh In this uh, blessed month of Ramadan It is today the 9th The 9th of Ramadan, the 9th day And as they taught me when I was a student uh, in Egypt Many years ago we greet with uh, Ramadan Kareem And the reply is Allahu Akram Ramadan Kareem Allahu Akram so we greet you in uh, blessed Ramadan, the ninth day of Ramadan And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Might grant us in this blessed month forgiveness for our sins We thank him for blessed Ramadan We thank him that we have lived to see and witness another Ramadan We don't know whether there will be any more after this Because as you know uh, the big war is coming. Oh yes, it's coming. It's coming. It can start at any time. It can start at any time. And most of us will die in that big war. So this might be the last Ramadan. We pray that it might be the best that we have ever experienced. It is blessed Ramadan, of course, because of the Quran. But more of that uh, uh, later, inshallah. Uh, this... Uh, Lecture is being streamed uh, live on uh, IBNTT.com uh, You will see it at the bottom of the screen And you can also uh, find it on uh, YouTube at uh, IBN Master There it is at the bottom of the screen IBN Master uh, uh, You can make your telephone calls and ask your questions But only if you are in Trinidad and Tobago, we would rather if you are abroad uh, to send uh, an email But unfortunately I didn't bring my laptop with me today So we won't be able to answer questions by email But you can call uh, with your questions And uh, before we begin, let's just remind you If you are in Europe or you're close to Europe That we are, we've organized a seminar in uh, the city of Geneva where I used to be a student for five years, yes, in Geneva um, The seminar is on the topic of an Islamic response to Dajjal's electronic or digital monetary system, which is coming um, In that seminar you will be told Well, this is not the end of the road for them They want something beyond that, they want one Currency, one money, one electronic money for all of mankind, all of mankind But they wanted to do it incrementally so that we would not be aware of their plan hmm? So that's coming up uh, The seminar is on July the 29th, yes uh, At 4 o'clock in the afternoon And it will be at the Salsabil restaurant Which is located very close to the uh, you, the United Nations, the Palais de Nations And across the road is where my, my institute, the Graduate Institute of International Studies Which used to be at the, the lake, 
lakeside now they've built it a new building just across the road from Sal Sabil. Um, the owner of the restaurant has very kindly offered us the banquet hall free of charge but there's limited capacity and uh, the seminar will be at four o'clock in the afternoon and we have all the time we want to take and then there'll be a dinner uh, afterwards uh, upstairs in the main hall of the restaurant and uh, for that you're going to have to register for the dinner um, and you'll find the email address uh, in, on my website uh, imranhussein.org I noticed that many people have already registered from the, for, this, uh, for the dinner uh, from many different parts of Switzerland and France and so on and Germany uh, and other countries who are coming to the seminar and I look forward to meeting with you there in Geneva uh, this time we're going to have all the time in the world I can spend as much time as you want with you and we also have the dinner to chat and meet each other and so on so do please register and come to the seminar on July the 29th in Geneva and uh, uh, join us in the in the dinner now then I said that this is the blessed month of Ramadan and I on the last occasion, I think, uh, I remem remember saying to you that, wait a minute, the word Ramadan is in the Quran. Yes, it is. How many times? Only once. So you can't miss it. <laughs> Only once. And when Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, refers to the word Ramadan in the Quran, he defines it as a month. بَعْلَوْزِ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ شَهْرُ رَمَضَانِ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنِ So Ramadan is a month. And so we must always refer to it by the name given in the Quran, the month of Ramadan. And alhamdulillah, we all do that. But if the Quran recognizes the name of a month as Ramadan and we abandon that name and we assume or choose or embrace names made and concocted and manufactured in Rome by a Roman Catholic Pope, this is disrespect for the Quran, isn't it? And uh, a day of the week when we are supposed to we are supposed to shut down our business stop business and go to the masjid for Salatul Jum'ah and Allah refers to that day by a name He says إِذَا نُودِيَ لِلصَّلَاةِ مِنْ يَوْمِ الْجُمْعَةِ on the day of Jum'ah يَوْمُ الْجُمْعَةِ when the call is sounded for prayer hasten hasten to the masjid not to chat not to, to gossip not to meet your friends and go about talking and chatting and chatting and chatting, and chatting. ah yes my frustration Allah says فَسْعَوْ إِلَى ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ when you go to the masjid on the day of Jum'ah, you are going to the masjid for the zikr of Allah, not to chat. MashaAllah. For those who go to the masjid and remain silent, or if they have to speak, they'll do so in a whisper. And they either perform Salat Nafil or they recite the Quran or they sit down in meditation. Imagine, I go to the new masjid in Geneva. When I was a student, it was being built. And in fact, they opened that masjid while I was there. And the masjid was located walking distance from my, my flat where I was living with a student there. And I go back to Geneva now after 30 years or more. And I go for Salatul Jum'ah, and there are about 2,000 people in the masjid. MashaAllah. Many refugees in Switzerland. And you can hear a 
pin drop in the masjid. If you drop a pin, the silence is so beautiful. It's like going into a chapel, a Christian chapel, and the Christians don't go in their chapel and their church to chat. I don't think the Hindus do that in their mandir. So why must Muslims do that in the masjid? You're going in the house of Allah to chat. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم. When will we have uh, an imam who will stand up and tell the people, no, you're not invited to the house of Allah to chat and to gossip and to talk. Allah says, فَسَعَوْا إِلَى ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Hasten to the house of Allah for the zikr of Allah. Now if Allah describes or uh, mentions the name of the day as Yawmul Jum'ah, will we abandon the name that Allah gave and adopt the one given by a Pope, a Roman Catholic Pope in Rome? He gave it the name Friday in English. Uh, in French, it is called Vendredi, um, and uh, in in uh, in Urdu, they call it uh, uh, Juma. Um, yes, Juma. Um, but Friday is the day for the worship of a Scandinavian goddess named Fry. So it's time for us when Ramadan comes to show respect for the Book of Allah, which has set a precedent by referring to the names of the months by the name that were recognized at that time. Where did they come from? That's not important. What is important is our Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, he approved of those names. And he used those names. And therefore we should return to the use of the names of the month which is the Sunnah. And we should return to the use of the names of the week, which is Sunnah. Today is Yawmul Ahad. Yawmul Ahad. And we've been using the name given by the Pope in Rome, including Imran, yeah, Sunday. Sunday being, of course, the day for the worship of the sun. Hmm. And these are acts of, uh, of shirk. So our first comment today is respect for the Quran, which says, Shahru Ramadan, the month of Ramadan. Respect, therefore, for the names of the months, which are the Sunnah, and respect, therefore, for the days of the week, which are Sunnah. Yawmul Ahad, the first day. Yawmul Ithnain, the second day. Yawmul Thalatha, the third day. Yawmul Arba'ah, the fourth day. Yawmul Khamis, the fifth day. Yawmul Jum'ah, the sixth day, the day of the congregational prayer. And Yawmul Sabt, the day of the Sabbath, the seventh day. These are the days of the week. Teach them to your children. Teach them <laughs> to your grandchildren. And teach them the months of the year, and mashallah, as you make it the practice in the home to refer to the month by the name which is sunnah, and refer to the week, the day of the week by the name which is sunnah, there will be blessings in that home. Um, we I, I, as I said, I have to set the example myself because I mentioned once that uh, I couldn't catch my flight on Sunday and someone sent me an email, Sheikh, watch it, <laughs> all right? Now then, why is Ramadan a sacred month? We mentioned last week. Now let's remind you. The reason why Ramadan is a sacred month, a blessed month, Ramadan al-Mubarak, the month of Barakah, the month which is blessed. Why is it a blessed month? Answer, only one answer. 
It is because this is the month in which the Quran was sent down, the Quran was revealed. And so Ramadan is the month of the Quran. And it is because it is the month of the Quran that Allah chose it for the fast of Ramadan. This comes first, that comes after. So when Ramadan comes, this is the month to return to the Quran. How many times must I say that? Then there is something that happened every night in the month of Ramadan that we have to remind you, and you must remind others. Don't say, Sheikh, we already heard it. You're repeating yourself, Sheikh. Never mind. I am the teacher. Allow me to teach my way, okay? Be patient with me. Every, every night of Ramadan, Allah did something. The divine wisdom is at work. What did he do? Every night of Ramadan, he sent Jibra'il alayhi salam to the Prophet. Muhammad alayhi salatu salam, the angel Gabriel will come every night. An angel cannot come on his own. No. Incidentally, we cannot say an angel cannot come on her own. We have to say his own. Because Allah has given to the angels masculine names, not feminine names, okay? So the angel cannot come on his own. Allah is sending the angel every night of Ramadan. Why? Answer, because Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam has to recite the Quran. And before the end of the month, he has to complete the recitation of the whole Quran as revealed up to that time. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is establishing a divine sunnah that the whole of the Quran must be recited in Ramadan from cover to cover. Nabi Muhammad wasalam, could not read, could not write, could not even recognize his own name. So, of course, he had to be reciting from memory. Did he make it obligatory that all Muslims must memorize the whole Quran? I'm not aware of that. If there is such an obligation, do please send me an email, tell me where it is, because I'm not aware. Uh, no, no, I'm not aware that it is obligatory on all Muslims to memorize the whole Quran. I, I do know that the Prophet والسلام, expressed the desire that all Muslims should memorize Surah Yasin. Yes, I know about that. But I don't know that he has asked that all Muslims would memorize the whole Quran cover to cover. No, 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 I don't know that. If there is such an obligation, please send me an email because I don't know about it. So because he had memorized whatever was revealed to him, so he had memorized all that was revealed to him, so he was reciting from memory to Jibra'il al-Islam. We mentioned last week that it is therefore a divinely ordained sunnah that all Muslims must, mem must recite the whole Qur'an from cover to cover in the month of Ramadan. Is that so difficult to understand? Our subject is not complex, no. I'm teaching something that is so simple. Do we recite with our eyes? Can we fulfill the duty, the sunnah, of reciting the whole Qur'an cover to cover with our eyes? Or can we do it with our ears? No. Because in the Qur'an, Allah says, and oh, may, 
I made a little mistake last week when I was reciting this verse, so I correct myself today. It is in Surah Al-Qiyamah. And Allah says, بِاللَّهِ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ He says, لا تحرك لسانك به لا لا تحرك به لسانك لتعجل به That's the correct one. Do not hasten your tongue, your tongue with the recitation of the Quran. So it is with the tongue that we recite the Quran. If the tongue does not move, you have not recited. Did you hear me? Shall I repeat it? <laughs> if the tongue does not move, you have not recited. So the tongue must move in order for it to be recorded in the book that you recited. Hmm? And so when the month of Ramadan comes, if you have not been doing it so far, Remember, you got to recite the whole Quran in Ramadan. And I mentioned on the last occasion that someone, I don't know who it is who did it. Really, I don't know. Long, long ago. Somebody uh, cut the Quran into 30 different parts. We don't know who did it. Uh, it certainly was not the Prophet, because he would not do it this way. Uh, and each part now is called a juz. And you recite one every day, and at the end of the month, you've completed the whole uh, Quran. Well, whatever, whatever he had in his mind, well, when he, cho he chopped up the Quran this way, he did it in a way in which surahs were broken up. You know? And sometimes you would have a juz, and the last, last end of this juz is one, 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 only one verse of another surah. Remarkable, remarkable, remarkable that this is the system we have. Well, if you're comfortable with that, what can I do? But we prefer, as I said, to follow the sunnah. And the sunnah is that when you're reciting the whole Quran, cover to cover, for one week, he said, recite three on the first night and then five, and then seven, and then nine, and then 11, and then 13, and then the rest. And you have seven days for a week. At no time do you have a, a surah divided. No, it's always complete. So our way is let us recite the whole Quran, but we have, we have the surahs intact, we do not divide them. So someone asked a question, well, Sheikh, can I I'm not going to recite part of a surah on one day and the next part on the other day. But what about during the day, can I recite a part in the morning and a part in the afternoon and so on? The answer there is no prohibition against that. There's no prohibition against that, okay? Uh, and it, in, in fact, Allah has said, recite what is easy for you. So let me not make it difficult for you. It's just that those who want to follow the sunnah, this is how they recite the Quran. So on the first night of Ramadan, we recited Surah Al-Baqarah. And on the second night, we recited Surah Ali Imran. And on the third night, we recited Surah Al-Nisa. And the fourth, we recited Surah Al-Ma'idah. And on the fifth, we recited Surah Al-An'am. And on the 6th, we recited Surah Al-A'raf. And on the 7th, because Surah Al-Anfal is short, and Surah Al-Tawbah does not have Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, we joined the two, uh, Surah Al-Anfal and Surah Al-Tawbah. And then we recited Surah Al-Yunus, uh, and then Surah Al-Hud with Surah Al-Yunus, uh, two, and then Surah to Yusuf, uh, and so on, uh, until we finish the Quran. Someone asked me, sent me an email, rather annoyed. Why should I have to recite, rattle it off when, I, <laughs> when I'm not understanding what I'm reciting? Now that's a very important observation. Eh? If you perform Salat, you're praying to Allah. Can you pray in English?
Can you perform Salat in English or in French or in German? No. You've got to perform your Salat in Arabic. This is not Arabian empirism. This is the divine wisdom. Hmm? You have to perform your Salat in Arabic. You have to recite the Quran in your Salat and you have to recite it in Arabic. Yes? But if you just took the Shahada, like uh, I was, I, I go to Masjid al Furqan, uh, where the Imam is reciting, oh, mashallah, mashallah, mashallah. Allah blessed him with a beautiful voice. And he's reciting the Quran very slowly, melodiously. And my eyes are filled with tears every night that I go for Salatul Tarawih. You know, I stopped going to Tarawih, Salatul Tarawih. I stopped. Because all around me they were reciting at 95 miles an hour. And I could not tolerate that disrespect for the Quran. It is sinful to recite the Quran like that. And it is sinful to stand up there in the stuff and listen to the Quran being recited like that. I am not going to go along that road. I fear. I fear the consequences that my relationship with the Quran will be destroyed. You don't have the knowledge and you want to continue that way. That is your choice, not mine. So I stopped going to Salatul Tarawih in the masjid. Until, mashallah, I found this masjid, Masjid al-Furqan. Uh, and I understand there is also in uh, Charlieville, the Sima Memorial Masjid in Charlieville. Uh, uh, Sheikh Khalid is reciting the Quran and Allah blessed. He's Egyptian and he recites beautifully. Masha Allah. You wish that the Salat al Tarawi will continue all night when people recite the Quran beautifully. So if you have to recite the Quran in Salat that you are performing and it is in Arabic and you do not understand what you are reciting and you just took the shahada, we can excuse you. Yes. But if you took the shahada many years ago, and you've never made an attempt to learn the Arabic language to understand what you're reciting. And worse, if all your life you've been a Muslim, and everything else was important for you, everything else was except this. You never made an effort to study the Arabic language to understand what you are reciting in Salat. And then when someone else is leading the Salat and you are standing in the Saf, and when the Salat is over, somebody asks you, what did, he, what did the Imam say when he recited? And you say, I don't know, but it was a very nice tune. <laughs> what is the price you'll pay? This is disrespect for the Quran. If you're an Arab, it's even worse. Imagine, imagine there are millions of Arabs today who are either born in France and Germany and Belgium and Holland and so on, or when there's children. Notice I don't use the word kids, eh? I don't use the word kids. Only goats and Americans have kids. They when there's children. And because of the educational system devised and planned by Dajjal, they've lost. They've lost the capacity to even read the Quran in Arabic. They speak a broken Arabic, colloquial Arabic. Nobody understands them except those who belong to that area. And they cannot recite the Quran in Arabic. And when the Quran is being recited in Arabic, the Arab does not understand it. This is Dajjal's supreme, <laughs> supreme success. So, it is an act of disrespect to the Qur'an. Not to be able to understand the Qur'an when it is being recited in Salat and you are standing up there. And if you continue with that disrespect and you die with that disrespect, that the consequences will be terrible for disrespecting Allah. Yes, do not disrespect Allah. There are people who would give their lives if the Prophet ﷺ is disrespected. Masha Allah. But what about disrespect for Allah? 
This is disrespect for Allah. So stop whatever you're doing and go attend a class. Get someone to teach you. This comes first. This is the supreme priority in Ramadan to learn enough Arabic so you'll understand what you're reciting and you recite the whole Quran in Ramadan. When I said to you last week, when the month of Ramadan has ended, and mashallah, you recited the whole Quran. Of course, our sisters have a certain time of the, of the month when they cannot uh, recite. So these, these uh, the words are more applicable to the brothers and the sisters. When the month of Ramadan has ended and you recited the whole Quran, the Quran comes and knocks at your door, the door of your heart. Are you going to ban abandon me now? No, no. Don't do that. In the same way that you recited the whole Quran cover to cover in Ramadan, you must do the same thing in Shawwal. And then you must do the same thing in Zul Qaeda, and you must do the same thing in Zul Hajj, and you must do the same thing in Muharram, and you must do the same thing in Safar, and you must do the same thing in Rabiul Awal, etc. <laughs> if you had been teaching your children, if you had devoted attention to your children and your grandchildren, they'll be doing it. All their lives, when you're in your grave, they'll be doing it. So we, we, our message in Ramadan is very simple to you. Pay attention to the Quran and get into the habit of reciting the whole Quran cover to cover every month. Learn enough Arabic to be able to understand at least the surface meaning of what you're reciting. Now then, I gave a khutbah, Salatul Jummah, uh, two days ago uh, at a masjid here in Trinidad and someone came to me after the Salat. Uh, and I'm, I had mentioned in my khutbah that uh, there is no obligation to recite the whole Quran in the Salat of Tarawi because I notice now that Many masajid have instituted that you have to recite the whole Quran in Salatul Tarawi. Salatul Tarawi is the long prayers in the night of Ramadan. And because they have to recite the whole Quran, the hafiz of the Quran, of course, you've got to be a hafiz to do that, recites at 95 miles an hour. So I said, you do not have to recite the whole Quran in Salatul Tarawi. No. And someone challenged me and said, no, it is Sunnatul Mu'akkada. So let me respond to him today. When the obligation came down to recite the Salatul Tarawi and was communicated by Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, For the entire time that the Prophet lived, alayhi salatu wasalam, until he died, Salatul Tarawi was never, never, never performed as a jama'ah. Never. People performed Salatul Tarawi individually. The way you perform Salat Nafil, individually. Salatul Nafila. Individually. Some of them would perform it in the masjid, in different parts of the masjid. Some would perform it at home. And this continued all through the life until the Prophet ﷺ died. And during the time of the Khilafah of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the same thing continued. It is a well-established fact. No one can challenge it, not even with a bulldozer. The Salat to Tarawi in the Jama'a was instituted at the time of Umar radiallahu ta'ala So now, if it is Sunnatul Mu'akkada <laughs> to recite the whole Quran in Salat to Tarawi, and the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam should have ordered all Muslims to memorize the whole Quran. Did he, do, did he do that? How will you recite the whole Quran in Salatul Tarawi 
if you are not Hafiz of the Quran. If it is obligatory to recite the whole Quran in Salat al-Tarawih, you must be a Hafiz. And if it is obligatory for all Muslims, then all Muslims should become Hafiz of the Quran. It doesn't make sense. No, it's not true. It's incorrect. There is no obligation to recite the whole Quran in Salat al-Tarawih. If you want to do so, by all means, there's no prohibition. You can do it. However, do not hasten your tongue. La tuharrik bihi lisanaka lita'ajjala bi. Do not hasten your tongue to recite the Quran with speed. You know what I'm saying is correct. You know that what I'm saying is true. And yet it goes into one ear and come out of the other ear and tonight you'll go back to the masjid and recite at that monstrously sinful speed. Have you no sense? And you go and stand up in the stuff while he's reciting at that monstrously sinful speed and accept it. Have you no sense? This is why I'm so happy with the Imam at Masjid al Furqan in uh, St. Mary's village in South Oropoch. You go down the South Trunk Highway and you take left to go to Avocat. And about one mile, as soon as the road goes on a steep incline, on the right-hand side, you see the big building which is being used as a masjid. And I go there every night for Salat al-Tarawih, and it is a joy to listen to the uh, Qari reciting the Quran so beautifully. And I was just told that this is also being done at the Simab Memorial Masjid in Charlieville, but it's a little bit too, too far for me to drive from San Fernando. Uh, but uh, Sheikh Khalib recites beautifully, mashallah. So look for a place where the Quran is being recited beautifully. Look for a place where you can perform your Salat al Tarawih and your eyes will be filled with tears. And go and perform the Salat al Tarawih there, or better to stay home rather than to join in that sinful recitation of the Quran. Now then, Allah says, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَسُمْ Whosoever lives to witness that you're alive and the month of Ramadan comes, you must fast. فَلْيَسُمْ You must fast. And he gives us a law of fasting. وَكُولُوا وَاشْرَبُوا حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَكُمُ الْخَيْتُ الْأَبْيَدُ مِنَ الْخَيْتِ الْأَسْوَدِ مِنَ الْفَجْرِ ثُمَّ أَتِمُّ السِّيَامَ إِلَى اللَّيْرِ Eat and drink during the nights of Ramadan. Eat and drink until the white thread, thread, you know what's a thread? You have a kite, you have a thread. The white thread of dawn is distinct from the black thread. And then you begin the fast. The, the day has begun when the, you can distinguish between the white thread and the black thread of dawn. I don't have to tell you, this is Mutashabiha. You know it. The, the one who you, the fellow who, the companion who put a white thread and a black thread underneath his pillow, a morning he picked it up and he's having difficulties. So he went to the Prophet who then he gave the ta'wil or the interpretation of the Quranic ayah. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam, he had the knowledge and he gave the ta'wil or, or the interpretation of an ayah mutashabiha. There are two kinds of verses in the Quran. The ayat which are muhkamat, plain and clear, no need for any interpretation. And ayat mutashabihat, or verses which have to be interpreted. So he said, when Allah spoke of the white, white thread and the black thread, Allah is using symbolic language 
What he means by that is when the light of the day is distinct from the darkness of the night, that is when the fasting will begin. So eat and drink in the night time until that moment when the light of the day is distinct from the darkness of the night. I met someone in Lahore, which reminds me that, mashallah, we now have a group uh, in Lahore who are sitting, listening to the lectures and when, who have a discussion senar, session afterwards. And we have one in Quetta in Pakistan. And I'm so happy to announce that now there's a growing group in the, in the city of Hyderabad in India, which is my Hamwatan, I, my, my, my great grandfather, Pardada, uh, traveled from Hyderabad in India to, to Trinidad to about 200 years ago. Um, so I'm Hyderabadi, and I like the, I, Hyderabadi biryani, it's the best in the world. Uh, so there is, a, there is a growing group now in Hyderabad, which is uh, um, uh, meeting and listening to the lecture and, uh, and having a discussion session afterward. That discussion session is more important. Uh, there's one going to start in Karachi uh, soon, and we already have one in um, Kuala Lumpur in, in Malaysia. When the uh, month of uh, Ramadan comes, eat and drink during the night time. So this fellow in Lahore said to me, and he is big like this, he says, Sheikh, Allah told me eat and drink, so I spend the whole night eating, eating and drinking all through the night. I'm not making fun of you if you are listening to me in Lahore, okay? It's just I found it amusing when he interpreted the Quran this way. No, Allah says, do not come to excess. No, don't come to excess. You must eat with moderation. Hmm? And the Quran also says, Ohilla lakum laylat as-siyami. Rafathu ila nisa'ikum. It is also halal to have uh, uh, intimate relations uh, in the night, nights of Ramadan. Ila nisa'ikum with your woman, meaning the woman with whom it is lawful to have intimacy. That's what the Quran is talking about. Those women with whom it is lawful for a man to have intimate relations. I don't need to expand on that because that's going to take much more time. This is a new law of fasting. Yes. This is the first time we are fasting like this. We've been in the city of Medina for 17 months now. This is Shaban. This is the second Shaban in Medina after the Hijra. We left Mecca. We came to Medina, the Hijra. And we have been in Medina for 17 months. At that time, it used to be called Yatrib. And uh, we were also fasting in Medina. Yes. But we were fasting in accordance with the law which came down in the Torah. That's how we fasted for 17 months. And that law was different to this law. In that law, the fast would begin at sunset and continue all through the night and all through the next day until sunset. And during this period of time, from sunset to sunset, no food, no drink, and no intimacy, no sexual relations. That's how we fasted. And now comes down a new revelation in the Quran which cancels or abrogates that previous law and replaces it with a new law. Allah refers to this in the Quran, in Surah Al-Baqarah. And he says, بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ مَا نَنْسَخْ مِنْ آيَةٍ أَوْ نُنْسِهَا نَأْتِ بِخَيْرٍ مِنْهَا أَوْ مِثْلِهَا We do not cancel. We do not abrogate <coughs> any 
law which we send now. Nor do we cause it to be forgotten. The ayah here is a law. But that we replace it with that which is better or that which is similar. Notice I pause. Notice I'm speaking very slowly now. Why? Because Allah did not say that we replace it with that which is different. No. <laughs> he said we replace it. The old law is replaced with a new law, which is either better or similar. But we don't have the time to take up the subject of al-Masik and mansukh at this time. So we were fasting in accordance with the law of fasting given to the Jews and the Christians in the Torah. And uh, that's the way that Jesus, Nabi Isa al-Islam, fasted as well. Um, and now comes a new law of fasting. But uh, the, the, the masculine virility was so powerful. Uh, was it because of camel's milk? I don't know. The masculine virility was so powerful that many who were fasting according to that law of fasting could not stay away from their wives at night time. So Allah says, Alim Allahu annakum kuntum takhtanuna anfusakum Allah knows what you used to be doing secretly. You were supposed to stay away from them, but you used to go to them in the night time. Allah knows what you were doing secretly. Alim Allahu annakum kuntum takhtanuna anfusakum khana yakhunu to betray. Futaba alaykum. Wa'afa ankum. Allah has turned towards you mercifully and Allah has forgiven you. فَالْآن So now you can embrace your wives, your, sorry, your woman with whom you are legally entitled to have intimacy. That is the verse. You are now entitled to embrace them. وَبْتَقُوا مَا كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ And seek for what Allah has written for you. Maybe long time, 10, 12 children, now only one. Hmm? This is the Qur'an now when it chooses the month of Ramadan for fasting, a new law of fasting. It is the second Shaban in Medina. But this revelation in which the month of Ramadan is chosen for a month of compulsory fast, this had come down from the Law al-Mahfuz, the preserved tablet in heaven, come down to the Sama al-Dunya, the lowest of the Samawat, and it came down on Laylatul Qadr. So long ago, 14, 15, Fifteen years ago it came down. When Ikra Bismi Rabbika Ladi came down to the Prophet the whole Quran came down there. So why, why, why does Allah wait for fifteen years, almost fifteen years, to send down this revelation? from the Sama al-Dunya to Nabi Muhammad wasalam, promulgating the fast of Ramadan. Why did it take so long? What is Allah waiting for? And waited for almost 15 years. We will not be able to give you the full answer in the amount of time we have left for today. But we will begin the answer. I notice there are no calls uh, today. Um, let us recall 
that it is in the month of Shaban, which is the month which precedes Ramadan, that the revelation came down. فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَسُمْ Whosoever lives to witness the month of Ramadan, you must fast. It is happening in the Shaban, the month of Shaban. But something else happened in that month of Shaban. And that is that we used to perform our Salat facing the Qibla in Jerusalem. That was our Qibla. The Qibla means the direction of prayer. And Jerusalem was the Qibla for the Jews. Jerusalem was the Qibla for the, Hindu, for the Christians. And Jerusalem was our Qibla as well. And so when Nabi Muhammad والسلام, was in Mecca and he had to perform Salat, he would stand at a corner of the Kaaba where he could face both the Kaaba and Jerusalem at the same time. That is where he performed his Salat. Because he has a legal obligation to pray in the direction of Jerusalem. But his heart is with the Kaaba. But when we left Mecca and we went to Medina, now that is no longer possible. You have to pray in the direction of Jerusalem and your back is now turned to the Kaaba. <laughs> your back is turned to the Kaaba. It was a great test. It was a great test. And that is how we prayed for 17 months. Until Revelation came down. In the month of Shaban, the second Shaban in Medina, the same month in which the revelation came down about the fast of Ramadan. And Allah says, turn to the Kaaba. This is Naskh. This is abrogation. This is cancellation. The old Qibla is now cancelled for us, not for them. It is still the Qibla for the Jew. It is still the Qibla for the Christian. I made a mistake many years ago when I said it's now cancelled for them as well. No, I didn't study the Quran properly. I make mistakes. But Alhamdulillah, when I make a mistake and I recognize it's a mistake, I'm not afraid to correct myself. Alhamdulillah. And my students also must do the same. So Allah changed the Qibla. This is Nasr. Cancelled or abrogated the old Qibla for us, not for them. And gave us a new Qibla, which is the Kaaba. And that happened in the month of Shaban. The second Shaban. But something else happened. The next month after Shaban will be Ramadan. And so far we have been prohibited from fighting. No, not allowed. All of the 13 months, 13, sorry, 13 years that we were in Mecca, after the revelation came down for the first time, 13 years in Mecca, we were not allowed to fight. No fighting. And 17 months in Medina, no fighting, none. But next month will be Ramadan. And it was on the 17th day of Ramadan that we fought the Battle of Badr. If I'm wrong, please correct me, because I'm 75 years of age and sometimes I don't remember. Okay, I believe it was the 17th day of Ramadan that the Battle of Badr was fought. And we are fighting now, which we are not allowed to do before. The permission to fight is now given. We are not sure whether it was also in the month of Shaban, but it has to be just before Ramadan. So three things are happening at the same time. Number one, the Qibla is changed. Number two, the law of fasting is changed. Number three, 
the law of prohibition of warfare of fighting is changed. Kutiba alaykum al kital. Fighting is now made obligatory upon you. Kutiba alaykum al siyam. Fasting is now made obligatory on you. Why? Why? Why at this time? I'm going to have to keep you in a little bit of suspense until next, next week, inshallah, when we will attempt to answer the question, why has Allah done these things at this time? And before we proceed to answer that question, however, let me spend just a little time on the, on the question of abrogation, cancellation. Uh, I was uh, sitting in the classroom. I hope we have enough time. I was sitting in the classroom and my teacher was teaching uh, tafsir. Um, and it was the tafsir of Surah An-Nur or the Surah of Light, which is Surah number 24. And in that class, uh, I was a very old man and he loved to chew something called pan metal leaf and uh, it causes your lips to become red <laughs> uh, so may Allah have mercy on his <laughs> on his soul his name was Maulana Z Zafrullah he now passed away to Allah's mercy and in the middle of the class he mentioned to me something about it used to be in the Quran there's a hadith this used to be in the Quran but it's no longer in the Quran now and I woke up because many times I fall asleep in his class, you know. I woke up. It used to be in the Quran. It's not in the Quran anymore. And this sounds like nonsense to me. So I waited patiently until the class was over. As soon as the class was over, I went up to Maulana for the Rahman Ansari in his office. I said, Maulana, this is what they just told me in the classroom. And when he looked at my face, he said, Imran is in trouble. Is something used to be in the Quran is no longer in the Quran. He said, no son, they're wrong. What the, te what the teacher had taught me in the classroom was wrong. He said, no verse of the Quran, none, none, none have been kept. Cancel, none have been aggregated, none have been forgotten, none have been lost. Not. He said, if any verse of the Quran had been cancelled or abrogated, then the information should have come to us from he who was sent to teach the Quran. Allah says that he sent Nabi Muhammad that he will teach you the book. And this is very, very, very important. The teacher should teach. But there is no hadith, none, where the Prophet has ever said that any verse of the Quran has ever been cancelled or abrogated. None. And so the correct position is that cancellation or abrogation refers to previous revelation, previous laws. And I've given you the example that that used to be the Qibla, and now this is the Qibla. That used to be the law of fasting, and now this is the new law of fasting. That used to be a prohibition concerning fighting, and now the law has changed, and we have permission to fight. This is Nasq, and Mansuq and Nasq. This is the law of abrogation. I thank you for listening to me so patiently wherever you are in the world. And I pray that Allah might accept our fast of Ramadan, that Allah might accept our Salat al-Taraweeh, that Allah might accept our recitation of the Quran in Blessed Ramadan, and if we don't know the Arabic to understand, start attending the class, and that Allah might accept all the charity that we give in Blessed Ramadan. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.